Uh, hello. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, so in this talk, uh, apparently from the title, we'll be introducing something scary, and we will tell you about what went wrong. But before we start, uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, I'm a vulnerability researcher from TXY Networks. Uh, and that means I basically, my job is about finding other vendors' box. And by doing that, we ensure that the internet is safer because we tend to find box before the bad people do. And um, I employ multiple methods that will aid me in achieving such feat. And I also had presented a most uh, on multiple international conferences. And uh, because the time for this presentation is a bit tight, uh, we should begin with a bit of background story. So, uh, because zero days tend to be tied together with politics, we should explain what is war. War is a concept that most people tend to forget. Uh, and the war itself is a thing that is mostly fantasized, either in fictions or movies. However, there are some several problems regarding war in the real world. First, uh, even if you start a war, you may lose one. Second, in some fictions that nations suddenly have capabilities to pay for the troops and weapons magically, but in the real world, you have to pay for the weapons, either from taxes or your country's GDP. And most importantly, in the real world, when you go to war with other nations or other groups, people on both sides will die. So as a result, when you want to go to war or uh, someone started a war on you, you will need to have some serious discussions maybe in your country's Congress. However, as a Taiwanese, I am very familiar of how that discussion tends to go. And let's talk about another critical concept, which is called critical infrastructure. So back in a few decades ago, the US designated a few sectors as what they call critical infrastructure. The reason behind the name is that there are several industries that are very critical to a nation's day-to-day -day operation. And if any, any sectors inside the critical infrastructure were compromised, they may harm the, uh, the country's capability to operate daily. So it is actually very critical for all critical infrastructure to work even if the country is at war. And uh, there are already some real world examples of uh, any country's enemy compromising another site's critical infrastructure. And uh, we could see in some scenarios, for example, if you lose all of the sectors in the infrastructure, or even just some of the sectors in the in critical infrastructure, you will, you will naturally get lower GDP and therefore, you will receive less taxes for you to buy weapons. Uh, and another example is when you take over water, uh, the apparent one is uh, you lose uh, hydro dams, so uh, you will have less power generation. And in some worst cases, uh, if the enemy takes over your water industry, it is possible for them to weaponize uh, maybe certain water dams and flood in people's houses. If you take over electricity, then nothing works apparently because modern civilization relies on electricity. But we have noticed one sector that is more equal than others, which is telecommunications. So we have a graph on the right side. If you take out telecommunications, then you could see apparently that most things fail. So that brings us to the question. How do we try to attack telecom telecommunication? How do we cause a long lasting and hard to recover damage to telecommunications? 
we have enumerated multiple scenarios. For example, if you try to attack a network facility physically, uh, it tends to not work because the network could be built uh, with resiliency in mind. And if you attack the, uh, the ISP or the IX, well, they can be replaced and very quickly. That brings us to our assumption. What if we take over every modems? That brings us to another chapter. However, as we go on, there are some glossaries that we must discuss first. So these are several glossaries that may get confused. Uh, so one is the optical line terminal, which is OLT. It is an ISP equipment, which is in charge of turning IP protocols into any PON-based protocols. And on the client side, there are two kinds of equipment. Uh, one is called ONT, optical ne network termination. It is in charge of turning PON into IP, but it does not do routing or switching. Another one, uh, which is maybe more familiar with everyone here, it is ONU, optical ne network unit, basically an ONT uh, plus router. And sometimes, uh, especially in Japan, it is called home gateway. Uh, this can be confused with another term, which is called CPE, but CPE stands for anything that is on customer's premises. And for this talk, modems can mean, uh, can mean either the ONT or the ONU. And that brings us to another question. Why we think it's a, it is a great idea to attack the modems? Apparently, the first one is numbers. Uh, for example, uh, in 2022, NTD says they have 23, uh, a bit over 23 million flat Hikari subscribers. That could mean that NTT has maybe over 23 million modems. So, how's the concept of 23 million? That's a lot of devices. What if, you, what if you could take over every modem? You suddenly have 23 million proxies that you can use to bring down any nations on Earth. Uh, another one is uh, modems tends to be ISP's assets. So it, it is not like that you could just go out to any shop and buy another modem. It is very hard to defend the modems because it was given to you by the ISP. And the third one, which is my favorite, because the models of the modems are not fragmented, which means that the ISPs may have only a few couple models of the modem. So you could write once and exploit everywhere. And from our research, we have figured out that how the ISP over the road, uh, over the road uh, lays their network. Uh, on the left side is the ISP. Apparently, the ISP has the IP core, and they have, uh, they have an OLT to help them turn uh, the traffic from IP core into fiber. Uh, and in the center is a splitter. Uh, usually, the boxes you see on the streets uh, contains splitter. Uh, splitter is basically a mirror that could turn one splice of fiber into multiple, uh, multiple splices and then wire those splices into your house, which is the ONU. And for us, most end users are the ones on the right side using your PC and getting on the internet. So you, as you can see, this is a free layer infrastructure. So now that brings us to our target. So in the study, we decided to target uh, a telecom, which is Chonghua Telecom. It is the Taiwan's largest telecom telecommunication company. Uh, in 2022, they announced that they have 4 million subscribers, as Taiwan has roughly 20 million citizens. That is a, a quite big amount. Uh, and we decided to study one of its modem, uh, which, which I shown right here. Uh, so, uh, why we are here presenting this research to you, because in this research, we have found a way to compromise an ISP's infrastructure, and we believe that the same set of problems may appear in multiple ISPs around the world. Uh, and uh, we have also found several new zero days on the modems, 
and multiple common missing defensive options on the modem uh, on Earth. So essentially, we found the kill chain of the telecom. We are able to take over the tech, uh, take over all of the modems from telecom completely, and we will we will elaborate why it happened, and how should you defend against this. And for certain legal reasons, we have to elaborate on how we did our research. Uh, in fact, I obtained the modem on the 2nd of July. I started research on the 4th. Uh, then, uh, in this couple, uh, like six days, I found multiple uh, vulnerabilities that allows, uh, allows me to take over uh, all of the modems from the telecom. So, I contacted the Taiwanese officials. And then, on the 25th, the case was created. Uh, and it was made public a few days ago on 3rd of November. And between this time, uh, the bugs are fixed and they are already announced as public by the third. So let us elaborate on what went wrong. Uh, so our objective apparently is to hack everyone. Uh, how do we hack everyone? Uh, we have come up with several steps uh, that we think by a country accomplishing these steps, we could hack everyone. One, we should try to hack one modem. Two, we should try to hack the telecom. And by hacking the telecom and the modem, we could achieve free hack everyone's modem. Uh, and turns out, this uh, hypothesis actually works. Uh, and uh, we have tried to look up for some past literatures uh, and trying to learn from the ancients. Uh, it appears that uh, they are already a plenty of literatures regarding attacking the modem from the, from the land side, but uh, they, there is nearly none literatures that it describes on how to attack the modem from the wind sides, uh, minus a, a few ones. This is uh, one of the talks that uh, says how to attack the modem from the wind side. Uh, and from these scarce talks, uh, we think that and the remote manager seems vulnerable because every scenario they tend to be attacked. Um, so we actually think about how a modem could be vulnerable. First, the attack could be, com uh, could be coming from either the user side or the internet side. And on the modems, there are, there are actually several attack surfaces that you could use. Uh, one. Uh, is, the, uh, is the one that most people tend to not think about, is the baseband. So on the modem, it actually has a baseband, which is in charge of turning fiber uh, into IP protocols. Uh, however, because the baseband is, uh, is something in hardware, uh, if you could compromise the baseband, that, uh, that means your entire modem would be compromised. And uh, because every modem we studied uh, is using a Linux-based OS, they sometimes make some customizations. However, they tend to use uh, the functionalities inside the Linux kernel to handle any traffic that is higher than layer two. So if the Linux kernel contains any vulnerability uh, while handling the network traffic, uh, that will give you a kernel exploit, which means total takeover of the modem. Uh, and uh, on the man uh, for the management web, uh, usually it is open to the ISP and the user because apparently you want to set up your Wi-Fi and for ISPs, they want to adjust your routers uh, or modems remotely. And the last one is the uh, one that is less talk about, which is value added service. Uh, so uh, for example, in Japan, Hikari Denwa is one of the added service. And so let's talk about remote management. Uh, there are actually two styles of remote management. Uh, whichever the ISP chooses doesn't mean it is good or bad. It just different ISPs tend to do things differently. So for remote management, there is a standardized protocol called TR069. And another way to do remote management is for ISP to set up their modems uh, and to use the management web remotely. And however, like uh, we have studied multiple modems and the ISPs tend to go with the web management one. 
we don't know why, but it looks so. And in some cases, some ISPs uh, would make some configuration mistake and expose the management web to everyone on the internet. Uh, same, we don't know why. So nevertheless, we acquired uh, several pieces of hardware that is related to the modem we want to study. Uh, and we don't know how to start, so apparently we took it apart. Uh, but for most people, uh, that tends to have no knowledge about how to uh, attack an embedded device. I have some great examples here that you could use on the top of, of a slide. Uh, and I have also made your job easier uh, by, uh, by uh, flagging different components on the board. So for this board, you actually have multiple opportunities of interacting with a board. Uh, and the one we picked is the serial port. You could actually use a very fast multimeter or a logic analyzer to find the serial port. Uh, and in this case, uh, we could get a serial console access on the board. That's great, we have our entry. So for most boards, uh, there are actually some opportunities of doing uh, input-output operations. So for this board, we could either use the web, web management interface to do interactions with the board, or using the serial port, which we already, already have now, and another possibility is to interact with a flash memory directly. Uh, however, as a flash memory tends to be uh, a, bit uh, a bit complicated, we, t uh, we chose to go with an easier one, which is go with a serial port. Uh, and for such boards, uh, the boot process is like when you turn on the modem, uh, it will try to load the bootloader, and the bootloader will try to load the OS. But if you interrupt this process, for example, you prevent the, uh, the CPU from ever loading the OS, it will sometimes go to uh, some kind of rescue mode. And in some cases, you could dump flashes uh, using the rescue mode. So in our case, we found out that the board is using the chip from Broadcom. And a Broadcom has a very great uh, pre-boot environment, which is called uh, common firmware environment. And we found out that they have actually compiled a command that is very useful, allowing you to dump all of the uh, flash memories. However, the speed is very slow. It would actually take nearly a month to dump to the two gigabytes of memory on the board. Uh, apparently, we don't have 23 days. So we look into a bit into the messages during boot, and we found out that we could only dump some of the segments that we need. So we turned 23 days into 1.3 days, and that worked because we have used an open source tool uh, against the dump, and we have the root file system. And while we have the root file system, uh, we would also like to interact with the board interactively while it was powered on. How do we do that? Well, uh, there are actually two ways to do that. One, you could use Google, uh, because uh, for this modem, if you are using Google, then you could find its credentials on the internet. But we don't know that uh, at this moment, so we have used uh, a complicated process. Like for this modem, uh, while it was uh, while it was booting up, it will load a binary called console D, which gave you the login prompt. Uh, however, we figured out that we may be able to write a new firmware into Flash. So we actually repack another special version of the firmware and write it back to the Flash memory of the modem. And by doing that, we get a shell. Uh, so now we have a shell on the modem, and we also have a firmware we can start uh, analyzing the firmware. Um, and we have found another way in because we think the process is very difficult and hard to replicate. So we actually asked some help from Meta Mainton, uh, which is IDA Pro. Uh, we unlock the secrets of how the command line is handled. Uh, so for, for this modem, all comments are inside a jump table. Uh, and 
in some cases, it will treat the command uh, as something it should run in shell. However, uh, it has a deadly mistake. It basically does this sh minus c and person sign s, which is a uh, apparent command injection opportunity. So uh, by digging into the firmware a bit with Ida Pro, uh, we found some command injection. Uh, in fact, I found this in the first place with human fuzzing. Uh, however, I prefer to call it cat fuzzing because cat sitting on keyboard is that kind of fuzzing. So now we have several command injected from the modem. We have one new Emily failed. Uh, we can achieve RCE on the modem, but only on the LAN side. How do we turn it into, into the one side? So we need to seek the spark to light the fire. While we were analyzing the framework on the modems, uh, we spotted something very strange, which is um, the modem seems to allow certain public IPs to connect onto the modem. Um, so that looks a bit weird. It looks like this. Uh, there are several public IP segments that are allowed to connect into the modem. Uh, we don't know why the ISP want to do this, so I couldn't explain. But Shodan could tell us what is inside those IP segments. And uh, by looking into the results, uh, it appears that there were several histor historically proven vulnerable devices inside those IP segments. For example, they have a very outdated gate, which they took down by now. And also, they have another DVR. I don't know why you would want to put a DVR inside that, but it is there. And the best part is, uh, the vendor says the model is from 10 years ago, so uh, they wouldn't accept it as a CV number. Uh, so anyway, time to get some firmware. Uh, because the model is so old, we couldn't even buy it, so we tend to use Google. Uh, and by using Google, you will find some fishy links on the vendor's website, which takes you to Mega. Uh, and by downloading the file from Mega, you could find a firmware which you could extract. Um, and combined with the previous information from Shodan, um, we found a management interface into the DVR. Uh, how to get in? Uh, admin, admin. So uh, we could just get into the management interface uh, somehow inside the allow listed IP ranges of the modem. Uh, but how do we turn this into something we can weaponize or uh, exploit? Um, while playing around with the management interface, uh, it seems some kind of like a bit weird. Uh, so naturally, uh, as a hacker-minded person, uh, I would try to insert something that is not normal. Uh, so I again asked the help from Madam Mainton, uh, and it seems like another comment injection. So uh, by digging a bit, uh, digging into the firmware a bit with IDA Pro, it seems that we could achieve uh, arbitrary file write. And so we wrote in template language of the device because it, it has a template engine. Uh, and one of the commands in the template were to execute any commands. So we could first write a file with the template inside, uh, inside that file. And then we execute that file via CGI. Great. So now we have another Emily failed. Uh, so the question is, how do we light the fire? Uh, well, so we did a quick test. Uh, because that uh, we could actually compromise a DVR inside uh, inside the allow, allow list. Uh, so by doing that, uh, we could actually compromise everyone's modems because we were able to reach my uh, my own modem in my house uh, from from that device. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't show you the IP address. Um, however. Uh, because how uh, because the way the uh, IP tables were laid out, if you could uh, ICMP pin your own modem 
That would mean your let IP will also be able to reach your management interface. So why wouldn't we combine everything together and try to see if we could exploit every modem? Um, so uh, it appears that uh, we still have something missing here. We still couldn't hack everyone's modem. How do we get past? Uh, a problem with something we talked earlier, uh, let me get back a bit, is the bug we found requires you to be logged in onto the modem. So uh, on the right side is a picture of a diagnostic page. You need to use uh, an account to log into the modem and uh, go to that page to pull up this bug. So we need a way to get into here. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, so it appears after some, uh, some time spent using OS, uh, open source intelligence, uh, we found out the password rule is uh, basically tied to the IP address of your device. Uh, so, so in fact, for this router, the MAC address is printed on the bottom of the device. But if we want to exploit everyone's modem, apparently that we couldn't go to people's houses and take a look at their modems. Uh, because our target is to do mass exploitation. Uh, however, we found out that uh, the modem actually has a guest account, which is probably provided to the customers uh, to set up their Wi-Fi, because after logging in using this account, there is an interface say, uh, for you to set up, set up Wi-Fi. Um, however, there is an option on that page uh, that would state, uh, because the router actually supports 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, uh, so there will be two MAC addresses here. But however, for the MAC address that is used for the password, it is only minus one. So you could log in using user user and uh, go to this page and do some elementary school math. Then you can know what the password for this modem is. So by combining everything together, we could first compromise devices in ISP network, and thus we become the ISP. And we could also enumerate the admin credentials remotely. So we could turn our LAN side remote code execution into the WAN side. Uh, and we have think of some possible impacts that we will elaborate later in the slide. First, apparently, we could do full control of all modems from the internet. And by doing that, too, we could either hijack or sniff network traffic. There are some internet protocols. They are not encrypted currently. For example, uh, certain types of FTP, telnet, they are not encrypted. And DNS sometimes is not encrypted, so you can know where the customer is visiting on the internet. And you could also use it as a proxy. For example, there are certain Panda country attackers. They like to use Soho devices as a proxy. So this, this could be of their use. And you could also gain persistence on the device. Uh, so before going to that, I will play a small POC. Uh, yes, this is my desktop. So while doing this, because I'm, uh, I have, uh, I'm only alone, I couldn't show you my laptop, but this is a process. While I'm out of the screen, I'm actually executing the exploit, and this router is connected to the internet. I can make all LEDs blink, which is a cyber exploit. So let me get back to the slides. So that is how you compromise an entire country's network. By combining different vulnerabilities, you could actually hack a country or perhaps other countries. That would, that would bring us to our conclusion. We think everything is twisted. 
Why is that? Uh, first, I have a good meme from this, which is probably here. Uh, I don't think you don't need any anything of like RP or whatever else. Comment injection is all you need. And it appears that uh, modems are as insecure as most IoT devices. And because in this talk we feel uh, in this talk we feel very sad because we're able to take over ISPs and old modems so easily. Um, however. Uh, according to our research, we think the same mistake could happen to all ISPs around the world. It is very easy for ISPs to do such such kind of misconfiguration. And also, we have figured out that uh, in some cases that uh, you couldn't get a CV assignment for your findings. For example, you couldn't file a CV for like a, a loud list that is too big. And we have actually came past few key difficulties during this research. Uh, one, apparently, is to pick and obtain the device. Uh, because the devices tend to be owned by ISPs, so it is difficult to own one. And two, is writing the report. You have to actually um, emphasize the impact of your findings. And uh, as a hacker person myself, I don't like writing reports, so that is a difficult thing for me. The three I want to elaborate the most is vulnerability reporting. We have actually came across multiple hardships in vulnerability reporting. So apparently, because our research has found several critical vulnerabilities that could allow you to take over a country, uh, you have to be very careful to pick anyone that you are reporting to. And also, we don't know that if anyone have found it before us. So if the models were to be exploited by certain na uh, nation state actors, you have a very difficult time of figuring that out. And two, because this is a national security related bug, uh, if you are going to a civil run vulnerability reporting program, it, it could be a risk itself. For a state-run ones, because they are usually run by public servants, they are actually sworn while they are taking the job. So they may not leak the data. Uh, and so for, for some countries, they don't have a nation-run cert. So therefore, we call for countries to create an official cert, which, one, is open to anyone, any citizen, including non-citizens, could report vulnerabilities too. Two, uh, it can safeguard the reporter's safety and identity. Three, most importantly, it could enforce policy. For example, if a device is everywhere inside your country, then this search should be able to force the vendor from fixing the box. So now we have become more opaque by having more internet connected device in the world. And how would this blockchain works in real world. For example, if, if the world is only consisted of two countries fight, trying to fight each other, and a day, uh, the country on the left decided to invade the country on the right. Uh, and if the country on the right has tons of modems that are, tend to be vulnerable, what will happen? Uh, if the country on the left they decided to bomb the other country, uh, uh, that would be pretty... Uh, pretty bad for the country on the right because when, when you don't have telecommunication, you couldn't call for help, you couldn't even send money for weapons, you don't have power, you couldn't mobilize troops. So that would be a very major problem. And on the ISP side, it will actually be very painful to defend such attacks because on the ISP side, uh, the attack surface is so big and the ISP may not have proper resources to defend such attacks. So it is actually very difficult for ISPs to defend. Therefore, it is crucial for ISPs to build up what we call resiliency. Even if your network is breached, you have to actually survive the attack and uh, still maintain your company's daily operations. And how do we prevent such problems from happening in the future? Well, you don't, but you could embrace for it. First, I have to emphasize the importance of defense in depth. 
you should definitely apply network monitoring. Uh, like, for example, your management device inside the ISP shouldn't be sending out any outward tra traffic. If, if it does, then that, that could mean it, it was compromised. And two, you should perform audits because most, most of the network leaks, uh, leaks could be found. And most end user networking device shall be modernized. According to our research, we think most of the modems are, way, uh, are, are years behind some of the top of the line uh, IoT devices. So apparently that you should employ CPUs with root of trust support and you should employ secure coding and auditing. And lastly, more importantly, you should assume your device is living in hostile environments that maybe everyone out there is trying to break into your device. So you should build your device better instead of cheaper. So that would conclude my talk. If you have any questions, feel free to reach me on Twitter X uh, with this handle or send an email to me. And I want to give spe uh, some special thanks to uh, one, my, ma my manager, Kenan Kao, at, at my work, and my colleague, Shen Hao, and also uh, my friends at, uh, at the Taiwanese government. And on the right is the actual cat sleeping next to the modem. Uh, so uh, thank you for the talk. Well, thank you very much. Would you, would you like to have a question from the audience? Okay. All right, we'll go on to the Q&A session. If you have any question, please raise your hand. Over there at the middle. Uh, Taiwanese. Uh, I, as we know, Zhonghua Telecom is the largest ISP company in Taiwan. Uh, do you know how they page it in the following? Um, I wouldn't necessarily know about how they patch, but they have another newer version that uh, they have already fixed. So uh, for the modems you use maybe daily right now, it is already patched. That's why we are pre presenting the problems here. You see this car? 